Hi, my name's Mercedes. Welcome to Highlands Online. If it's your first time joining us or you're a regular at Highlands, it's so great to have you. Welcome. We'd love to hear from you on our Instagram, Facebook, or via our website if you have any questions or prayer requests, or you just want to say hi. We hope you enjoyed today's message. Hey, we are talking in the series <clears throat> on counterculture. It's been all right? It's been good? I've enjoyed it. And this idea that we are not supposed to be, as the church and as Christians, just kind of like everybody else, but with a kind of sporadic Sunday club membership. That there is supposed to be something that marks us and makes us different to what the kind of dominant culture that we live in is. It's riddled all throughout the Bible, all the heroes of the faith, all the outstanding people of the Old Testament, we look at and go, they were so different to everybody else. God had picked them and that he'd done something significant through them and it was indeed significant. That Jesus himself came, he wasn't crucified because he was the average of everyone that he walked amongst. That he was exactly the same as everything else. There was something different about him and he called the disciples and kept teaching them, hey, this is how... Not how everybody else lives, but this is how people who follow me, who live in the kingdom of God, are to operate. In fact, it's central. The kingdom of God, his preaching, isn't going, here is how to add something into your existing life. It is, here is something to give everything else away to obtain. In fact, his parables consistently reiterated the fact that people would sell all they have in order to grab hold of this precious thing that they had found that he'd likened to the kingdom of God. It is something different. Otherwise, what is all the fuss about? What is the work of the Holy Spirit actually doing? See, I think sometimes we get caught up in the manifestations and the experience and the tingles, and I love all of those things, and we forget that the primary role of the Holy Spirit is transformation. Not spectacle, transformation. There is spectacle about it. It is amazing. The power of God moves. It is awe-inspiring because it is not from this world. But nor are we as followers of Christ. And I want to have a look at what Peter's saying to the church here in 1 Peter chapter 2 to start us off. Because Peter is revealing to us that we are something. Anytime that I've found that the Bible says to the church, or to us, that says you are, we've got to take note because it's not saying you might be. It's not saying that one day if you try hard enough, you'll eventually get there. If you are a follower of Christ, if you are the church, Peter is identifying something from God that you are in this moment. This is what he says, he says, but you are not not like that or the world. He says, for you are a chosen people. You are the royal priests or royal priesthood, a holy nation. You are God's very own possession. As a result, you can show others the goodness of God. For he called you out of the darkness and into his wonderful light. Once you had no identity as a people, now you are God's people. Once you received no mercy. This is what he's saying to us. Before we were in the kingdom, before we knew Jesus, I I, I had no mercy from God. That's a dangerous, scary place to be. I don't want to be there. But he says, once I had no mercy, but now, now I've received God's mercy. Dear friends, as I've warned you, as temporary residents and foreigners, others say sojourners or travellers through this world, it's not just talking that you've got a temporary life to live, but where you reside is only temporary. It's like I've only got, I'm only doing like a 12-month stint in in Toowoomba or something. The, The same kind of words that he's using here of going, hey, you're only living in this place, world, but you are an eternal being. It's just, I've, I've warned you to keep away from worldly desires that wage war against your very souls. See, let me remind you, church, that your goal, a primary goal of the Christian walk is to be more like Jesus. That is the primary, the utmost goal. God is not calling us to be just a more kind version of us, just a friendlier, smileier, you know, fist bumpier version of everyone else. God is not asking me to be a better version of Doug for the sake of the world. He's asking me to be like him. 
The world does not need a slightly more advanced dug. It needs someone like Christ. And that is what we are called to be as the church, is this pursuit of being more and more Christ-like. That is the goal. Don't drop the goal. You look, get this even for a second. You are not called to be more like other Christians. They are not the goal. Yeah. Here's what I found, that when we start to just uh, uh, kind of compare ourselves and manage ourselves according to how other people are living and other Christians, is we start to focus more on behaving more like Christ did rather than becoming like Christ is. We just go, as long as, if I can just look the part, if that is what they do, oh, they pray like this, they pray for that long, they act like this way, they've got these kind of morals. We are just trying to pass a membership test rather than being transformed by the Holy Spirit. If Jesus is our goal, transformation is the only pathway there. We are constantly desiring to be transformed. But if just attendance, if membership, if, if being included and morality is the goal, we are just looking for behavior modification. So other Christians aren't our goal, Jesus is our goal. He is who we keep our eyes fixed on to become more and more like Him. And honestly, this is what sets the church apart, is a group of people who are looking more and more like Jesus. From the rest of the world, Jesus is a stark contrast, isn't He? Doesn't take a lot of internet browsing to find some things that are in direct opposition to what Jesus said He stood for. If you woke up this morning and checked any kind of social media, you would see a whole lot of people up in arms about some things that are blatantly coming against the things of God. And that's not unique to today. That's like a daily occurrence, is wake up and see what are we angry at today? (laughs) See how the world is operating like the world today. And we get shocked that people who don't know Jesus aren't like Jesus. Oh, how are we shocked today? Well, we find another one. But it is in stark contrast that we as the church are more like him apart from the existing culture that is today. Remember, Jesus did not come to establish a happy, clappy subculture of what is going on today. He came to bring an absolutely opposing kingdom. Something that is so variant, something that is so different. And this is why, if you read the Gospels, what Jesus is not, he's not teaching behavior modification. He's, he's bringing a rule of going under the king. This is what life looks like. He's not talking about a patch of turf going here, this is where I'm establishing my rule. He's saying anywhere that these, these principles are lived out, anywhere that this spirit is breathed, this is what it looks like to live in the kingdom of God to flourish in the way that we were designed to flourish. See, sometimes I think we get caught in this subculture. You understand the idea of of a subculture is that we may start here, but if the overall culture moves, even though I might be on this side of it, if the overall culture moves, I I still just stay on this side of it. And And as long as we think that I'm on the right side, and I'm not making any political thing there, but if we're on the right side of how culture moves, Well, I'm still to the right of it, aren't I? And as culture keeps slipping, we go, well, I'm not going with it. I'm still over here on the right side of where culture has slipped. But over time, we realize we've slipped so far from where God might have actually called us to be. And I believe that the church and so many of us have bought into this thing of going, as long as I'm on this side of where culture is, I'm, I, I'm set apart, I'm different. But the reality is, is God is calling His church to be planted, not as a subculture of a sliding world, but planted in the kingdom of God. That doesn't matter what empire rules, we remain the same. Doesn't matter what politics is in charge, we remain planted on the rock. Doesn't matter what workplace we're in, what school we're in, what laws get passed, we are planted on the rock of ages, not the rock of seasons, the rock of every age that is going to exist. We are planted on it, church. This is who we are, a counter culture to whatever the world dishes up. That is where you will find the church. That is where you will find those who are followers of Christ. Don't get sucked into the tide of drifting as long as I'm on the flag part of the riptide, I'm going to be okay. No, we are planted firmly on the rock, not building our house on big grains of sand. We're not getting sucked in that way. This is why Peter says we are a chosen 
people, a royal priesthood. Not a kind people, a friendly aversion, but a priesthood set apart for only one purpose. He says we are a holy nation called out of darkness and into light. In other words, followers of Jesus, well, we are not like everybody else. We're not anti everybody else, we're just not like everybody else. We are supposed to be as counter as light is to darkness. In fact, as I said, this is a primary role of the Holy Spirit in our life, is transformation. It's transformation every single day. If you're waiting for a touch from the Holy Spirit every Sunday, you're waiting six days too long. You should just be every day going, well, I want a touch from someone anointed and from the corporate gathering and from the moment, but Lord, in my car, I need you. Transform me more like Jesus today. In fact, this is what Paul says to the church of Corinth in 2 Corinthians 3. He says, the old way with the laws etched in stone led to death. <clears throat> That's essentially our behaving our way into the kingdom just leads to death. Though it began with such glory that the people of Israel could not bear to look at Moses' face, for his face shone with the glory of God. Yeah, how cool would that be? He's like a walking light bulb. Let's see if you put a string on him. Anyway, that's where my mind went immediately. I'm on a journey, guys. I'm being transformed. Even though the brightness was already fading from him, Shouldn't we expect for greater glory under the new way now that the, Holy, uh, that the Holy Spirit is giving life? Verse 16. It says, But whenever someone turns to the Lord, the veil is taken away. For the Lord is the Spirit. And isn't this beautiful? Wherever the Spirit of the Lord is, that's where there's freedom. Another way to read that is wherever the Spirit is Lord. That's where there's freedom. You can be sitting in this place and you go, well, the Spirit of God is here and I'm still bound up. Can I suggest that you might have it flipped around, that the Spirit needs to become Lord? And you'll experience freedom. Anyway, that's not what I'm talking about. That's a freebie. Verse 18 says, So all of us who have, heard the, uh, have had the veil removed can see and reflect the glory of God. And the Lord, who is the Spirit, makes us more and more like Him as we are changed into His glorious image. See, what I like about this one is we see Moses' face shone because of the presence of God that he was standing in. But now what we're being told is that it is our whole life that should shine to the world because of the presence of God that is within us. Moses stood firmly in a tangible presence of God and it started to change his actual condition. Whereas Paul is saying to Corinth here, going, hey, it's not just a moment you go up to a mountain, you get radi like supernatural radiation, you come down glowing. But there's this Holy Spirit, the same presence that Moses stood in, now lives within you. It should shine out through you for ever-increasing glory. Other versions say, from glory to glory, or one stage of glory to another one. In other words, this transformation continues. That once we step into this relationship with Jesus, he, what he's taking us on is this journey to change our very being, our nature, from one degree of glory to another. That it should show uh, to everybody else. There should be a distinct difference between the church and every other part of society. As, as stark as it was, but Moses is the only one with a shining face. Like how easy to find him in hide and seek, right? Right? Just in the whole crowd of people, like if you ever get lost, you just look for the walking light tower. But it is the same sense that Paul's saying here, we're going, this should be the church to the world. We should just be walking light towers, letting our light shine. In fact, that's what Jesus said in Matthew 5. Let your light shine before others, that they may see your good deeds and glorify the Father. Not going, wow, aren't they nice. But they go, there's something different about them and they bring glory to the Father. See, from glory to glory, what God is doing in us should make us different. Can I tell you, church, that, that the work of the Holy Spirit, it makes us think different. It makes us speak different. That we are called to, to live different, to act different. We are get different kind of givers. We are different kind of spenders. We internet different. We binge different. We eat and drink different. Colossians, Paul says, let everything that we do, do it as if we are doing it for the Lord. Because we do it all different. We are called to be set apart. 
which means we do it different. We have different kinds of relationships. We do friendship different. We do engagement with society and culture and politics and world and finance. We do it all different because we are marked by God that is different to the world. That he came to bring an opposing kingdom, not a sub-kingdom of this world. Going, hey, I'm going to let the enemy rule your life, but can you just give me a sliver? No, he says, I've got a brand new plan for you, a whole new nation for you to be. In fact, I'm calling you out of darkness and into my wonderful light for you. I think some of you need to hear this is that God has not diminished his plan and his goal and his call for your life just because it's 2024. And going, well, you know what, the rest of society has slipped away, I may as well just, you know, you go with it, but just be a little, like, he's a little bit different. Now, God's best for you is still God's best. He has not got a smaller vision for your life just because society seems to have slipped just because others have slipped on their standards, just because the definition of holiness is kind of objective to most of society. His best for you is still his absolute best. His desire for you is to experience not just life, but life abundantly. Not just freedom, he keeps saying it, free indeed. He emphasizes all of the promises that he has for us because his best is still his best. 2024 might come, you're like, well, look at everybody else. Let's get our eyes off them and put our eyes fixed back on Jesus. Our goal is not to be more like them. Our goal is not to be a better version of me. Our goal is to be more like Jesus. You with me, church? Come on. This is who we are. This is not the impossible mission. This is the one that he has given us the Holy Spirit to say, hey, I've given you all that you will need and I will be faithful to complete the good work that I've started. We're not on our own. This isn't a a message of condemnation. This is just an invitation into the very relationship that God's invited you into. God's best is still his best. We can't make justifications based off how other people are living. Let's just say yes to what he's offering. Look at Philippians 3, I think this might be. One, probably my favorite chapter in the Bible. I'll say that most weeks, but this one, this time I mean it. <laughs> Verse 12, it says, I don't mean to say that I've already achieved these things, which means forgetting about the past and being perfect. He says, or that I've already reached perfection, but I press on to possess that perfection for which Christ Jesus first possessed me. No, dear brothers and sisters, I've not achieved it, but I focus on this one thing, forgetting the past, and looking forward to what lies ahead. I press on to reach the end of the race and receive the heavenly prize for which God, through Jesus Christ, is calling us. See, I love this. Who's calling us towards something here? It's not saying the heavenly prize is a call from your workplace. The heavenly prize is a is a call that society is giving you. You know, if you just pursue that, those kind of like hustle goals that the world is kind of luring you with, then you'll receive a heavenly prize. It's not, not calling you to a heavenly prize through your social settings, to your school, through media. Politics definitely isn't calling any of us through to a, a heavenly prize at the moment, is it? It's Jesus yeah. that has laid before us a heavenly prize. And the invitation to be like Paul and go, well, I'm going to press towards it. I'm not going to keep my eyes on other people. I'm not going to just be a shifting subculture and sinking on the sand. I want to build on the rock that I might press forward to the things that God has for me. C.S. Lewis writes in his book, The Weight of Glory, I've shared this one a bunch of times, but he says this, it would seem that our Lord finds our desires not too strong, but in fact too weak. We are half-hearted creatures fooling around with drink and sex and ambition when infinite joy is offered to us. Like an ignorant child who wants to go on making mud pies in a slum because he cannot imagine what is meant by the offer of a holiday at the sea. Look at this. We are far too easily pleased. We're far too easily pleased to live in a subculture in this world when God is calling us to something far greater. And I want to encourage us today to take stock and go, God, where am I living? How am I speaking? Where, what, what's the invitation you have? Is this your design? Is this your plan for the way that, that I'm, I, I'm to, to live my life? Or am I just playing around in the mud and happy with the mud pies? 
when there's infinite joy offered to me. You know, if I just hustle, if I earn a little bit more, if I get a little bit more, if I, if I rest a bit more, if I have a few of these things and that thing, is, is, am I chasing just decorated mud pies or is, is my heart designed to pursue the infinite joy that's ahead of me? The heavenly prize am I pressing towards? I'd love you to consider in what areas of my life I need to reorient back to Jesus. See, one account of Scripture that comes to mind when I think of too easily pleased compared to what God has offered is a, is a fun story uh, in the Old Testament of a man named Samson. Now, we find <clears throat> this in Judges chapters 3 to 16. If you haven't read it, I recommend reading it. It's a hoot of a story. Um, <laughs> I've had family members not believe it's in the Bible until they saw it with their eyes. But it's a bit of fun. But the account begins here with a miraculous birth to a barren woman and an angel who has declared that this kid, Samson, will be a Nazarite, will have that vow upon him, dedicated to God. Now, this Nazarite vow includes things like abstaining from wine, avoiding unclean food, not touching dead things, uh, but also not having his hair cut. So he has probably a big man bun by the stage that we get this story. But not having his haircut, there's a the part of the, that Nazarite vow. But not only was he following a few interesting rules, uh, but he was given extraordinary strength. He's a very strong man, and uh, which I kind of relate to Samson. But... <laughs> uh, uh, so good. I'm on a journey, guys. But... But here we find the story that Samson creates, he, he kind of does all these incredible feats. He kills a lion with his bare hands, uh, his physical hands, not bare hands, but um, that's, that's a good one. I get it from David, because David kills a lion and he kills a, kills a lion with his bare hands, but he kills a bear before it, so you're like, with his bare hands or his bare hands? Grammar jokes are good, right? Anyway, let's move on. I've lost some of you. But after he did a pun, he also killed a thousand Philistines with the jawbone of a donkey, which is interesting. Kill a thousand of them, which default, if you're counting, kind of keeping up with the story, default breaks his vow already by playing around with dead animals. Not the first time he did this either, but he's playing around with that. In fact, he's broken it a number of times because as strong as a man as he was, he had a few red flags. One predominant one that marks his life is his kind of appetite for interesting women. In fact, we see that three times that he's taken a woman that he was told he wasn't allowed to be with. And in fact, his most infamous one is a woman named Delilah. That many of you will know the story. In fact, the Philistines had bribed Delilah to get the secret out of Samson of how we can destroy him. And there's a bit of reading here, but it's a fun story, so we're going to read it. Okay, Judges 16, so we'll pick up. So Delilah said to Samson, please tell me what makes you so strong. And it wasn't creatine and extra WPI, but... <laughs> and what it would take to tie you up securely. Samson replied, well, if I were tied up with seven new bowstrings that have not been yet dried, I would become as weak as anybody else. So the Philistine rulers brought Delilah seven new bowstrings and she tied Samson up with them. Uh, she had hidden some men in one of the inner rooms of her house and she cried out, Samson, the Philistines have come to capture you. But Samson snapped the bowstrings uh, as a piece of string snaps when it is burned by a fire. So the secret of his strength was not discovered. Afterward, Delilah said to him, you've been making fun of me and telling me lies. <laughs> how good is that she's playing the victim here? Um, now please tell me how you can be tied up securely. Samson replied, well, if I was tied up with brand new ropes that had never been used, I'd become as weak as anybody else. So Delilah took new ropes and tied him up and the men hiding in the room with it before. Samson, the Philistines have come to capture you. But Samson again snapped the ropes from his arms as if they were a thread. Then Delilah said, well, you've been making fun of me again and telling me lies. <laughs> and, and tell me how you can be tied up securely. 
Samson replied, if you were to weave seven braids in my hair into the fabric of your loom and tighten it with the loom shuttle, I'd become as weak as anyone else. So while he slept, Delilah wove the seven braids of his hair into the fabric and he tightened it with up, pulled back the loom shuttle, yanked his hair away uh, from the loom and the fabric, then Delilah pouted. <laughs> oh, how can you tell me I love you when you don't share your secrets with me? You've, you've made fun of me three times and you still haven't told me what makes you strong. She tormented him with her nagging day after day until he was sick to death. Don't put your hand up if you've experienced it. Finally, Samson shared his secret with him. My hair has never been cut, he confessed, for I was dedicated to God as a Nazarite from birth. If my head was shaved, my strength would leave me and I would become as weak as anybody else. Delilah realized that he'd finally told her the truth, so she sent the Philistine rulers. Come back one more time, she said, for he's finally told me the secret. So the Philistine rulers returned with the money in, her, uh, in their hands. Delilah lured Samson to sleep with his head on her lap and then she called uh, in a man to shave off the seven locks of his hair. In this way, she began to bring him down and his strength left him. Then she cried out, Samson, the Philistines have come to capture you. He woke up and he thought, I'll do as before and shake myself free. But he didn't realize that the Lord had left him. So the Philistines captured him and gouged out his eyes. They took him to Gaza where he was bound with bronze chains and forced to grind grain in the prison. So we want us to take note here of how was Samson, the strongest man, brought down it wasn't by force it was by temptation it wasn't an arm wrestle they tried all the ropes and the string and the braids and looms but it was by temptation of what was on offer opposing what God had called him to be and it's the same strategy that's at play in the church today and in fact well, definitely in a Western world, is that first here we see that temptation lures us by promising pleasure. Always lures us by promising pleasure. The Philistine rulers told Delilah in in verse 5, he says, seduce, entice, seduce Samson, lure Samson to tell you what makes him strong and can be overpowered. So she went in there to seduce, to lure with some pleasure. Because before temptation will ever betray us, it will always woo us with the promise of satisfaction. Before the living apart from Christ and being in the world and living as the world does, before it leads to destruction, it will always lure us with the promise of satisfaction. No, just a little bit's okay. Don't worry about those standards. Those are old school. That's, that's weird. That's the old way of doing things. No, that doesn't work. That generosity and sex and uh, the way your lifestyle, the things that you say, the way that you act, the, how you spend your time, what's on the internet, all that sort of stuff, that doesn't really matter that much as long as well, you just believe in the concept of Jesus, right? It lures you with the promise of satisfaction before it leads to destruction. John Piper once said that the, the power of all temptation is the prospect that it will make me happy. No one ever sins out of a sense of duty. <laughs> This is the problem with temptation, right? It's very tempting. Otherwise, they'd call it something else. (laughs) It's incredibly tempting, temptation. That's the frustrating part about it. No one ever sins out of duty like John Piper says. If it wasn't so desirable and feel good for at least a little while, we would never do it. We would never have a sin problem if it didn't lure us with pleasure. But that is the temptation that the world brings. I want us to keep remembering I'm too easily pleased with my mud pies. I'm too easily pleased when God has superior joy. The psalmist in Psalm 16, 11 says that in your presence, God, there is fullness of joy and at your right hand are pleasures forevermore. The fullness of joy, not moments of it, not tastes of it, fullness. See, the temptation that the world offers, it rests in this belief that it, in fact, offers better satisfaction than God does. That its way of relationship is better than actually what God's way of relationship is. It, its way of, of being is better than God's ways of being. And it rests, temptation rests in this gray area that many of us have going, what if God's way isn't actually as good? 
What if there's not pleasures forevermore and fullness of joy? But that is, in fact, what God offers us. So it promises pleasure. And the second thing temptation of the world does to pull us out, temptation just wears you out. It is relentless. It is a constant thing. If it doesn't lure us with pleasure, it assaults us with shame and it does not let up. We see, look, even with Delilah, when seduction failed, she started questioning Samson's integrity. She said, how could you say that you love me? And that might not be what the world says, but it definitely says, how can you say that you love God and still struggle with these things? You may as well just succumb. You may as well turn away. How could God love you? Did God even really say? And it is a relentless attack of relentless shaming. It tempts our integrity and our longevity. How can you say that? And Delilah pressed him hard with the words day after day and urged him, until his soul was vexed to death, another translation says. See, temptation often exhausts us through relentless pressure. And maybe you've resisted anger and lust in moments. You've resisted cravings or laziness you've pushed away. But some of us eventually, we give in, all of us eventually, it's points we have found that we've just given in in moments of weakness. We are tired, we are not caffeinated, we have been around the wrong people, we've been out of the presence of God for a time and all of a sudden, guess what? That pressure is still there, that voice is still there. Maybe the pressure of those around you and the fatigue that comes from standing counter and outside of a subculture that others are, of being excluded or seen as something different and we get tired, temptation. If it cannot please us, aims just to wear us down and bring us back into the world. It's a prolonged wave of warfare. And for any of us who have tried to get in shape and get healthier, we know that it requires more than just a momentary moment of resistance, yeah? Because the bag of cookies is always there. The ice cream's always in the freezer somehow, and if it's not, I put it there anyway. A moment of strength is fine, but it's when I go through it next day, tired and sad. It's still there. And so it requires more strength. And for us as a church, come on, we are called to be overcomers. Ready? The head and not the tail, above and not beneath. And what that requires is more than just moment times of victory, but it requires us to be every single day walking in the strength and the joy of the Holy Spirit. Every day. Because the day that we start peeking over the fence, guess what temptation is still there with the lure, with the shame, with the pressure. And I don't want to be like Samson, who just succumbed to the pressure, succumbed to the, the lure. Church, if we want to be a people who walk in victory, it is only found in walking with the Holy Spirit eyes fixed on Jesus and pressing forward towards the goal that he puts before us. That is where it is every single day. There is no such thing as a part-time Christian. There is no such thing as part-time ministry. We are all in it, a holy people, a royal priesthood set apart out of darkness and into light. It is full time every single day, uh, new mercy and new blessings and promises are laid before us. It is not on lay by, it's not something that we just pick up and put down. This is something that every day that God has put something in it. I love Paul in Ephesians, he said, he's created you with good works ahead of time, planned for you. In other words, every day you get up, there was something planned, like a dad who takes the kid fishing. I love this, right? Dad sets it all up, baits it, puts the anchor on, and then hands it over to the kid. And he goes, I'll put something on there for you. The kid rolls it in. What if we were to wake up and go, God, you have already set something for me today that you've already baited and hooked and anchored. You have cast it out. You've got something on the line. Today is by the Holy Spirit, I will find the thing that you have created me for from one degree of glory to another degree of glory, from promises to promises. Lord, that you would do something in me. I'm not putting it down to chase something else when you've set something up for me. See, we are a chosen people. Just like Samson, just like the apostles, which means that temptation was, is going to come. 
So we're not anti the world, we're just different from it. Don't, don't start to be like it, don't creep into it. When God has called us and set us apart, we know the thief will come to kill, steal and destroy, but Jesus is the one that wants to offer us life and it abundantly. If you want to live in the abundance of life, it is found in Jesus. It is found in following Him. It is found in being different. It is found in being that holy nation, a royal priesthood. Not in the world, but in Christ. So as I said earlier, church, this is not a condemnation. This is in fact just an invitation that God puts before us through His Word. Of would you reorient part of your life or all of your life? Would you reorient it where you put Jesus before and maybe put Him back in the center? Would you reorient your life and say, Jesus, you are actually Lord, not a tag in. You're not this demigod that I'm bringing along with me, this genie in my pocket that I'll whip out when I need a car park. You are Lord of it all. That you might make me more like you. Not a better version of me, but more like Jesus. This world is asking, it's desperately crying out for a church that is like Christ. That is the grace and the love and the power and truth of Jesus. And so would you respond to that invitation wherever you are in your journey, not, not, not there yet or you're decades in, would you respond today and reorient where Jesus is in your life? Come on, church, how about we pray together? Father, I thank you for that you sent your son not just to die for us, but he lived for us as well. That he was the example of this teaching that he gave showed us what, what life in your kingdom is actually like. Lord, and help us by your Holy Spirit be more and more like you, Jesus. Help us overcome temptation, to be overcomers, to be the people you said that we are from one degree to another. Lord, I don't want to be just another subculture. And Lord, I pray this church just isn't sub of the world, but we can be counter, a light on the hill, that we are salt and light to this world. Help us, Jesus. Now in this moment of, of worship, maybe, maybe you've never asked God into your life. I want to give you that opportunity this morning to say yes to Jesus, to come into your life and to begin that transformation, that work that only He can do. That healing, that freedom that only comes in Jesus. That nothing else in this world offers. It is a heavenly offer. And I want to give that to you this morning for you to say yes and ask Him into your life and begin that journey with Him. So if that's you this morning, I'd love to pray with you and to know who you are. And as an outward sign of that inward decision, I just want to ask you, would you raise your hand in the air as that sign of saying, Jesus, I want to know you. Would you come into my life? Thank you so much. Is there anyone else this morning? Fantastic. Well, Jesus, the people who are responding to you this morning, would you continue to open their eyes and Holy Spirit, that you would transform them, that they would experience your freedom to greater degrees than they've ever done before, that they'd find their purpose and that they could make a greater difference in this world, I pray. Jesus' name. Amen. We hope you enjoyed today's message. If today's message did impact you and you gave your life to Jesus, we'd love to hear from you so we can help you take your next steps in your journey with Jesus. So please reach out on Instagram, Facebook, or via our website. We hope to see you again soon.